Hello, today we're going to talk about Texas property taxes, protest hearing, exemptions, and other information. My name is Shalette Mitchell, and I'm with Lone Star Legal Aid within the Longview Branch Office. But first and foremost, I have to get some important notices uh, out to you all. This presentation is intended to serve as legal information and does not replace legal advice. Lone Star Legal Aid does not discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, creed, gender, gender expression, sexual orientation, age, national origin, ancestry, disability, marital status, or military status in any of our activities or operations. Before I get further started even further, I want to just give you a quick little background on Lone Star Legal Aid, who we are, and what we do. Lone Star Legal Aid is the third largest provider of free civil legal assistance to low-income eligible clients. We have 14 offices that serve 72 Texas counties and four Arkansas counties. We handle a wide variety of legal matters such as eviction, public benefits, debt collection, public education, family law, and so much more. I encourage everyone to visit us on the World Wide Web at www.lonestarlegal, loan is spelled L-O-N-E, lonestarlegal.org for more information. Now, as I said, we're going to be talking about Texas property taxes. But before we can dive deep into that subject, there are some key players that you need to know about. The most identifiable one are property owners. And I want to make certain you know that property owners can be either residential homeowners or business owners. And these people are those who pay taxes, pay property taxes in the state of Texas. So you maybe uh, hear them referred to as property owners or the taxpayer because that's what they do. They own and they pay property taxes. Then also there's an appraisal district. That's another big key player when it comes to property taxes in Texas. Texas has 254 counties. Every county in Texas has an appraisal district. And that appraisal district appraises the value of all property within that county. Within the appraisal district, there is the chief appraiser. It's the appraisal district's chief administrator who reports to its board of directors for its operation. Another important component of players is the appraisal review board. It is a board of local citizens that settles disputes between property owners and appraisal districts. And they are appointed, um, appointed by the judges and uh, they run for the position appointed by the judges and they get training through the state comptroller. Then there are such things as local taxing units. These are the school districts. So Kilgore ISD, Houston Independent uh, uh, School District, Klein Independent School District, Bel Air Independent School District, Marshall Independent School Districts, the counties, whether that be Gregg County, Harris County, Fort Bend County, Travis County, Bear County. Those are another players in the cities themselves the junior colleges and the special districts such as the uh, municipal utility districts. These are all the units that collect taxes in, in that uh, county. They have to decide how much money is needed to provide these public services. And then they set the tax rates that property owners will pay. And last but certainly not least, is the tax assessor collector. It's an entity that collects property taxes on behalf of the local taxing units. Uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll know about the 
county tax assessor collector because that's where you go to do your car registration. But they also are a lot of times contracted with the taxing units to collect the property taxes. Sometimes uh, there is an overlap where some taxing units may actually contract with the appraisal districts to collect their taxes, but the appraisal district, even though they may be contracted, do not actually levy a tax on any property owners. And I, it's very, very key to know that property taxes are local, but state law controls the process. Let's talk about the property tax cycle. Texas property tax system has four main phases that happen within certain time frames. There's the appraisal phase. The appraisal phase takes place from January 1st through May 15th. This is where the appraisal district values the taxable property. On January 1st, that's a really important date because that is the day that begins property valuations since it determines whether the property is taxed, the value of the tax property, qualifications for the exemption, and who is the responsible party uh, for paying the property tax on that day. So January 1st is very, very important. Then within that same appraisal phase, January 1st through August 30, 30 excuse me, January 1st through April 30th, the appraisal district makes decisions on property tax exemption applications. Then from April 1st through May 1st, the appraisal districts send out those notice of appraised value to the property owners within that county. Then on May 15th, the appraisal review boards receive appraisal records from the appraisal districts. Now we're going to transition to the uh, equalization phase. I like to want people to think that the equalization phase is where the appraisal review board resolves disputes and appraisal records are approved. The biggest time and what we'll spend a chunk on the presentation, a good, good majority of the presentation will be on what happens between May 15th and July 20th. This is a time where the appraisal review boards hear and decide on property owners' protest and taxing units challenges. So that is where the protest system really gets underway. Then on July 20th, the appraisal review board approves the appraisal records. They have to uh, significantly decide on all of those protests and challenges within that time frame. And then on July 25th, the chief appraiser of the appraisal district certifies the, the appraisal roles and delivers them to the local taxing units. So that brings us to the assessment phase. The assessment phase is where the local taxing units come together and adopt the tax rate calculate those taxes, and then they send out the tax bills to the property owners after they receive the appraisal rolls. Then the final phase of the property tax cycle here in Texas is the collection phase. This is where taxes are collected and penalties and interest are applied on, delin on delinquent taxes, taxes, excuse me. October 1st through January 31st is, is really the big timeline for this. On October 1st, the tax assessor collector sends the tax bill to property owners. And then property owners have until January the 31st to pay those tax bills. Because on February 1st, if those tax bills are not paid in full, or you're not eligible for some type of installment, and we'll get to that if there's a, uh, for those who may qualify, then on February 1st, penalties and interest can begin to accrue. Then on July 1st, I know we've gotten a little past the January 31st, forgive me, but it is a part of the collection phase. The 
Additional penalties may be added for legal costs if you have not brought your property taxes current or they remain delinquent. Now, let's talk about, let's, we're going to focus now on the protest hearing, the dispute aspect. But I wanted to share this with you. And the reason why I think it's so important that we have this discussion about uh, protest hearing. Texans property tax bills are the sixth highest in the country. According to the Tax Foundation and Wallet Hub reports, only five states pay higher property taxes in Texas. Can you believe it? We may not have uh, a state income tax. We do pay for it in our properties. It's only New Jersey, Illinois, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Connecticut pay more in property taxes than we do as Texas. In addition to our pro property tax bill ranking being number six, the real estate market uh, with the limited supply of homes and high demand within Texas recently, our real estate markets has caused our home values to skyrocket. And because of these sharp increases, the higher um, home values has led to a higher property tax bill, which is why we get to the protest hearing. In a nutshell, the protest hearing is where you dispute the appraised value of your home, okay? Like I said, during the appraisal phase, the appraisal districts have to determine the value of your property. And they have to do that at least once every three years. And that value is determined based largely on market conditions on January 1st. Generally, you can dispute your appraised value, okay? The general deadline to a dispute, excuse me, the proposed appraised value is May 15th or 30 days after the date the notice of appraised value is delivered, whichever date may be later in time. If you disagree with that value set by the appraisal district, you can file a written protest. There are other things that you can dispute, but given the nature of today's presentation, we're not going to talk about those. But some of the things I'm just going to give you, for example, are the failure to send uh, the required notice by the appraisal district. If the exemption was denied, you can dispute that. If um, you're disputing like an agricultural use or a space use or, a, or some other type of special appraisal being denied, you can dispute that. The most common way that you can dispute that is by using the model notice of protest forms. Uh, either form uh, is based, going to be based upon the county size. The links are included in this presentation, but they will be uploaded to the comments. I'm going to apologize to you because on my next slide, I do have a copy of the notice of protest. You would receive this when the appraisal district mails out the notice, but you can go online to the Comptroller website at that hyperlink that is shown on this PowerPoint but will be uploaded. Or you can also file a notice protest electronically if that's available in your county. Again, we're going to talk about the property owner's notice of protest form. And like I said, it's dependent upon the size of the county, the county population size. First and foremost, it's going to be, you have to show that you are the person claiming an ownership interest. So that is what section one is talking about, the property owner. And I want to put this out there, uh, somebody who leases property, if they're required to pay the property taxes and the actual legal owner of the property does not file a protest, then a person who is leasing the property 
can do a property tax protest. And that is what all section one is about. Section two is going to be about the description of the property that you are filing the protest on. Section three is going to be about the reason for protest, okay? Section three, in my opinion, is going to be one of the most important parts because the reason that you choose for the protest influences the type of evidence that you may present at your hearing, and it also influences your appeal options if that becomes necessary. So commonly, and I know this is really, really small, you can't see it, and I apologize, but the most common things uh, that we see and, and, and that people are protesting is about is the incorrect appraised market value and or the value is unequal compared with other properties, okay? These are the most common reasons for protests in residential property and allow for the widest types of evidence. And this is what we commonly see in, um, in the property tax uh, uh, protest. And again, I know you all can't see it, but section five on this form, is going to be, how do you want your hearing, your protest hearing? Do you want to show up in front of a single member appraisal review board, or do you want at least a three member appraisal review board? Do you want to request an informal hearing before you have your formal protest hearing? Do you want to go in person? Do you want to go by telephone conference call and submit evidence? Do you want to go by video conference call if, if it's eligible for the county? Or do you want to go on just a written affidavit alone um, and deliver that before the hearing begins? Then section five, section, excuse me, six is going to ask you about the notice hearing and procedures. Do you want that notice to come to you by regular first class mail, certified mail, by email? Uh, you want electronic reminders. Those are some things that you can do based upon your preferences, okay? But I will urge you, if you choose email, make certain that it is an email address that you check regularly, okay? And then if you choose uh, by mail, then know that sometimes things happen with the United States Postal Service. So make certain. And if you do certified mail, you're going to have to agree, may have to agree to pay that additional cost for that, okay? And then section seven, uh, that's going to be for property values in excess of 52 million, since that's not my client population uh, that we do because Lone Star Legal Aid is for low-income clients. We're going to browse right on past that. But if that applies to you, you definitely want to make certain you answer those questions. Then Section 8 is just going to be the certification and your signature. Know that everything you say in this protest, you're doing this uh, under, uh, uh, under uh, penalty, of per uh, uh, penalty of perjury. So everything that you're saying is true. Now, after you file the protest, excuse me, after you file timely filed your protest, you'll receive a written notice. Like I said, it'll be based upon what method you chose in that uh, protest notice. Property owners can also request and try to resolve the disputes informally with the appraisal district before the formal hearing with the appraisal review board. But what is key is that you have to timely file your protest. If you, you can do informal and not do a, a, a protest, but if you want to ensure that you could actually have a formal hearing with the appraisal review board and make your, your beliefs and uh, opinions known about the, the inaccuracy, you have to timely file your property test uh, notice of appraisal, okay? 
if the property owners choose to try to resolve the the dispute informally you're going to sometimes you can call generally meet up there and schedule something i suggest well in advance of the date that was given in the notice of the actual formal hearing okay um, you'll call and you can see about scheduling something or you can try to do a walk-in it just depends on really the property size and you can do this informally sooner rather than later, okay? And during that meeting that you're having, I suggest that you get the appraisal district and the appraisal uh, appraiser, one of the appraisals within that district to explain to you how they reached the value that it did with respect to your home. And you're also going to make certain that you've done your um uh, homework beforehand okay you want to make certain that the property description is correct and that the measurements of your home and your land and and lot sizes are all accurate you want to make a request to see about getting uh information that the property uh, that the appraisal district plans to use in defending against this property tax and to establish the value that it used to set for your property. They must give you give you this data, even if it would normally be confidential. So let's continue on talking about how to dispute. Like I told you, the two biggest reasons uh, that people, we see people using to dispute is that the incorrect appraised value, the market value, was wrong. This reason usually occurs when the property owner believes that the property's appraised value is too high or above the market value, or it's just too high in general. So the property owner feels, and I like dealing with round big numbers, let's say that the notice of the appraised value was 200,000, okay? But the property owner feels as though no, I can't get 200,000 for this home if I put it on the market. And I've seen other homes go on the market, right? I can't get 200,000. I think it's more like 150,000 if I try to put it on the market. Or you're going to also take into consideration that there could be some reasons why you can't get that based upon the condition of the property, that $200,000. Because appraisers, like I said, they have to do it um, for all of the property within that county. So it's a lot. And there are different methods and approaches that appraisers and, and within the appraisal district can do when making that valuation on your property. But who's going to know the condition of your home? Probably no one better than you, right? Because you go in your home with the, uh, often and you'll know about foundation issues or if your bathroom needs updating or if you have some cracks, some uh, inadequate plumbing or you need to update your kitchen or you have to make some substantial repairs, okay? Those things are going to be what's known as hidden defects when it comes to making that $150,000 home in your property owner's opinion and between the appraisal district setting that value at $200,000, okay? So you want to make certain that you have some things to support this when you are making that uh, property tax uh, protest. You want to take example, and whether that be uh, pictures of the crack foundation or statements from a repair or estimate cost when it comes to repairing your plumbing issues or your electrical issues, because those things are going to show while although the appraisal district did do its work and said it was worth 200000 homeowner, property owner, taxpayer comes in and can show and lay 
the foundation and show that no, the home should really be based uh, and valued at $150,000. Then some other things that you can do is go about and see about comparable sales that happen. And you wanna tend to try to get them closest to January 1st as possible. Um, as possible so that you can show, but you wanna make certain that these are properties in similar size, location, age um, to your home, okay? As possible, because you wanna go, you wanna compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, not apples and oranges, apples to apples, oranges and oranges. Then the other method that we see as it relates to protest hearing in those disputes is the value is unequal compared with other property. This is another common reason, but this one is going to, it's a little more um, nuanced, shall I say, as opposed to the incorrect market value. This reason usually occurs when a property owner believes that the property's appraised value is unequal compared to the value of similar properties, okay? The three big key factors, the three big takeaways that are that the protest is going to have to focus on for this type of valuation is the number of properties selected for the sample reasonable. Are there properties in the sample comparable to the subject property? And was the value of each comparable property appropriately adjusted by reference to the subject property? Like I said, this is a little bit harder. This is more of a tough nut to, a nut to crack, shall I say. Um, and you may want to consider getting an independent appraisal by, the real, uh, by a real estate appraiser or by a uh, an independent appraiser because the selection of similar properties and the application and the adjustments must be based on generally accepted appraisal methods and techniques. So you want a professional there. But one good thing that you can do is that the uh, uh, appraisal district is required to give you evidence of similar properties in the area so that you can learn if they were treated equally. And all you have to do is make that request and you have to make it timely. Let's talk about the formal protest hearing. So like I said, in the event, the informal protest hearing didn't go in your favor or you still want to pursue it and, and because for some other reason, you all can reach a decision, you and the appraiser within the appraisal review board, uh, appraisal district could not agree on something as far as the value or anything like that, you want to be able to proceed with the formal hearing process. So I want to make certain I take away this one big myth is that the appraisal review board listens to the property owner and the chief appraiser before it makes a decision. The, the appraisal review board is not a party. They're the judge. They're going to be the trier of the circumstances, okay? So it's not all of those three parties against one another. The property owner presents its side and the chief appraiser of the appraisal district presents its side, the appraisal review board listens, and then it makes a decision, okay? Those, these hearings, because it's so many, just depending on the county size, and depending on how many people choose to go forward with their formal hearing process in the time frame, these hearings are usually going to be lasting about 15 minutes, okay? And they're required to be informal as possible under the law. But the appraisal review boards are required to follow their written and adopted procedures. So even though they are informal, and this is a board composed 
um, and made up of citizens within that county, they still have to follow their own written process and procedures. And once you get the notice of the hearing, you will be provided with the copy of those uh, adopted procedures, okay? Property owners can appear at the hearing in one of four ways. You can appear in person, you can appear by affidavit, where you offer your evidence and argue, uh, arguments without appearing in, in person. You can appear by telephone conference call, where you offer your arguments and affidavits and evidence by affidavit or video conference where you offer uh, your arguments and evidence by affidavit. But one thing I must say is that uh, you have to make certain if you're not, if you're appearing by any of these methods and you plan on presenting evidence and arguments and physical documents, you have to provide the appraisal review board the and the uh, chief appraiser with copies, physical copies of everything that you uh, plan on presenting. And you either need to do that in advance or directly before the hearing, okay? I would suggest to do it in advance because sometimes once you present this, this uh, evidence and your arguments, that could resolve it and there may not be a need. So the sooner you can do it, the better. And one other thing, and I apologize for not including this sooner, is that a property owner is able to appoint or designate someone that they want to represent them. And you can do this by filing a form, okay? With the, uh, uh, excuse me, with the appraisal district. But the key things, that you want to do is that you want to make certain because the property owner has to present and stick to the facts and focus on the property details and their protest concerns, okay? That is the big takeaway. And the property owner wants to make certain, you want to make certain that you're presenting your side, your arguments in a simple and organized manner that identifies the reason for your protest and, and, and shows the appraisal review board why the decision should be made in your favor to make an adjustment to the proposed value. In most cases, the appraisal district has the burden of establishing the property's value by preponderance of the evidence presented. And remember how I told you, um, I'm going to provide a link, um, will be uploaded to the property owner's affidavit of evidence, which is what you would use if you want to present evidence and make that file. And it, like I said, it can be either hard copy, written copies, or you can do digital copies like a USB drive, okay? After the protest hearing is concluded, so those 15 minutes are over, uh, then the appraisal uh, review board is going to rule on the protest, okay? It will mail it its decision or email you its decision. If the board rules in your favor, the appraisal, uh, chief appraisal of the appraisal district will tell the local taxing units, so your municipalities, your cities, your independent school districts, it'll tell those taxing units about the change so that they can make the necessary adjustments. But if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the board, the property owner can still make an appeal with the state district court in the county where the property is located. But you have to file a petition uh, for review within 60 days after you receive that decision. So again, like I said, your mail, checking it frequently, whether that be United States Postal Service mail or email if you so choose. You want to make certain because that clock starts as soon as the receipt of the decision. 
Now that we talked about the property tax protest process, let's talk about ways to save on your property tax bill. And those ways to save are with property tax exemptions. Texas has several property tax exemptions for, uh, for the property and for property owners. An exemption is great because it removes some or all of your property from taxation, which is going to reduce the appraised value and that ultimately lowers the tax bill. So let's talk about that. The, the appraised value is uh, the property value is going to be, we're going to stick with our my same $200,000 example, okay? A property tax exemption can either give you, like I said, a partial or a whole exemption from property taxes. So a property tax exemption that is common is going to be $40,000, okay? It's going to remove uh, $40,000 of the exemption. So if that home was uh, $200,000, it's going to subtract $40,000. So, or whatever the amount may be, 40 or, or even greater, okay? So $200,000 minus $40,000 is going to be $160,000 that you're paying on property taxes. So rather than paying the full 200,000 values by getting, a, by applying for and receiving a property tax exemption, you're going to be paying, in the example that I use, uh, property taxes on an amount of 160,000. So you're going to lower your property tax bill just off the bat. Some of the common property tax exemptions here in Texas are going to be the general, excuse me, are going to be the general residence homestead exemption, a disabled person exemption, a person age 65 or older or 55 or older if they're the surviving spouse, a disabled veteran or surviving spouse, uh, airship exemptions, surviving spouse of a first responder killed in a line of duty, surviving spouse uh, of an armed services member killed in the line of duty, or fatally injured in the line of duty. Let's start off with one of the biggest ones and the one that I urge everybody to uh, get if you qualify for, is the general residence homestead exemption. And this is how you know if you qualify for a homestead exemption. First and foremost, you have to own your home. And it does not have to be 100% complete ownership. You just have to have some type of ownership, a partial ownership interest it counts for a residence homestead exemption. It has to be your principal residence. You can only have one principal residence in Texas. And then you're required to have a Texas driver's license or a Texas ID card that your address matches for the principal residence that you are seeking the exemption from, okay? As long as you get and meet all three of those criteria, all three of those eligibility components, then you get it as long as you apply and you do so timely. And because of that, you get to limit the increase in the property value that it can go up. So if it's your residence homestead exemption, the property value cannot go up greater, cannot increase greater than 10% a year, okay? And then Texas law requires that $40,000, that's why I was using the $40,000 school tax exemption for everybody who gets a general residence homestead exemption. So this one is uh, the, the one that you have to get. This is the basic, it's the first step 
before you can pass go to getting. I encourage you to get it sooner rather than later. Then we have the over 65 and disabled persons exemption. Let's talk about the over 65. You have to meet all the criteria that we just talked about, all of those components for the general residence homestead exemption, and you have to be age 65 or older. And it starts for the entire year when the property owner turns 65, okay? So even though, as long as you own the property on January 1st, and you say you don't turn 65 until August, you get that property tax exemption for the entire year. That's the only thing you need to qualify for the over 65. For this disabled person exemption, again, just like uh, I said, you have to meet all the components of the general residence homestead exemption. And then you have to be eligible to receive disability benefits from the Social Security Administration, okay? And it's for the entire year that you became or are eligible to draw benefits from the Social Security Administration, okay? These exemption benefits, we, we kick it up a notch. We go up a notch, okay? Because that allows you to put a ceiling on your school tax or freeze those school taxes, okay? Also, it gives a 10,000, an additional $10,000 school tax exemption under state law. And then it makes you eligible for tax deferral and installment payments. I wanna focus in here a little bit on tax deferrals. A property tax deferral is something that allows you to postpone your property tax payments, but you can only do it if you are either uh, getting the over 65 or the disabled person's exemption, okay? Uh, so what that means, and say that your property tax bill was $3,000 a year, okay? If you qualify for over 65 or disabled persons exemptions and you get either one of those exemptions, then you can file a property tax deferral affidavit where the, you are telling the appraisal district that you want to postpone your payments, okay? The taxes will still continue to be due, but the appraisal district and those taxing units, specifically the local taxing units, will not be able to start the collection process against you and no additional late fees, penalties, or interest can be charged against you. But always tell people this, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, and the reason being is because I want you to, I, 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 it's a decision that you have to make, but I want to make certain that property owners know that the, the, the money is still going to be due. It does not excuse it. It just delays it. So I always like to advise my clients and Lone Star Legal Aid clients, and, and when we go out into the community, to pay as much as you can, whatever that may be, okay? because um, even though you're not getting those additional penalties and interest, they're still accruing and accumulating over time, okay? Another key benefit uh, for this these two exemption is that you're allowed to make installment payments. You can make four equal installment payments if you get the over 65 or disabled person's exemption, okay? And, and last but not least, you cannot get both of these exemptions. I wanna make certain I'm abundantly clear on that. You have to choose either the over 65 or the disabled person's exemption. What I like to tell people, uh, my clients and people in general, is you have to make the, the decision that gives you the biggest bang for your buck. What gives you the best benefit? 
because yes, state law requires uh, certain exemptions, right? As we can see the uh, school tax exemption. But like I said, the local taxing units are the ones who set certain amounts. So you want to see, again, where you get the biggest bang for your buck and make that decision, okay? So which one will lower your property tax bill the greatest? And that can fluctuate year by year. So don't get in the habit of, um, of just keeping it on autopilot. You want to make certain you look at it periodically, if not yearly. Um, I, I would at least say every three years, but I would, I would be a strong proponent of you doing it yearly. Then there are tax exemptions for over 55 surviving spouses. This is another big one because a lot of times you'll see it uh, in certain client populations where only the one particular spouse in a, in, in a marital couple uh, will be the person that handles all of the finances. I see this quite often now, uh, or believe it or not, but only one person was doing it uh, and, and taking care of that for the home. But then that one person, that one spouse who was taking care of this has now died, okay? Uh, so long as you and, and the spouse, a property owner and the spouse were married and that person qualified for the over over 65 or the disabled person's exemption, those two exemptions that we just talked about, then the surviving spouse is eligible to get and carry over that uh, exemption so long as they are 55 years of age or older on the date of death of their surviving, of their deceased spouse, excuse me. And those exemption, this exemption carries the same benefits as the over 65 and disabled persons exemption. Another big uh, tax exemption that I want to take a little bit of time to talk about is the home um, airship exemption, okay? It used to be uh, before the Texas legislature uh, took it among their infinite wisdom to make people who inherit homes, so whether people die, uh, generally who die without a will or they're not a record, but you inherit a home from the record owner. Most common things that, that I see and we see here at Lone Star Legal Aid is where children have moved in to take care of their aging uh, parents, okay? And they're the heirs and their parents just left behind them, their siblings or whatnot, but they didn't leave behind a will or anything like that. But under Texas law, you stand to inherit the property, okay? And because of that, the Texas legislature made it where you can file for an airship exemption based off of your inheritance and dying, uh, the record owner dying with lot, without leaving behind a will. You can file an affidavit in the real property records maintained by the county clerk uh, or the Texas legislature gave the ability to you, for you to do an affidavit that establish your ownership interest in the property. And all you have to do is answer a few questions. You have to say uh, that uh, establish your ownership interest by showing that you are heir of the person who died. You can do that. You have to provide a copy of the death certificate for the prior record owner of the property and then a, cop, a copy of the property's most recent utility bills. And utility bills, they got to be something like electricity, gas, uh, you, you, uh, electricity, gas, water, landline telephones. Those are going to be 
recent uh, utility bills that can be provided. And if there was something where a court showed the applicant's ownership of the property, then you want to submit that as well, okay? And if you get that, the exemption can be applied for people who are not record owner or people who inherited the property, okay? So I would encourage everybody to go ahead and make that application for any of these type of exemptions and multiple other exemptions. But because of the sake of time, I just wanted to focus on the key common ones that we see. Your exemption can be filed by mail, by email, by mobile app, or online if the appraisal district offer those for your county, okay? Depending on when the application is submitted, it may take some time. Um, try to submit everything all at once. If you have to get, like I said, your uh, driver's license or ID, utility bills if you're required to do that, or documentation that you receive, Social Security Administration disability benefits based upon your disability, such as your award letter. You want to do uh, all of those supporting documents and the application itself all at once, okay? You can either go to the Comptroller's website. If your appraisal district has a website, you can download the form from there. You can ask for one to be mailed out to you, or you can go to the local appraisal district to get a copy of those. But you're going to uh, uh, complete that, get that application, complete it, make certain you check everything, double check it, and submit the supporting documentation so that you can start getting those exemptions, okay? The appraisal district has to let you know whether or not um, the exemptions have been approved, okay, or, or denied for whatever reason that may be. And if they're approved, that is great. You're going to start saving because you're going to lower that property, uh, taxable property value because you're taking away a part or possibly all depending on what exemption you may be eligible for, okay? And then another place where you can go uh, make certain of uh, what exemptions you qualify for, two key places, either you can go online on the appraisal district's website and see all the exemptions. Sometimes they won't list everything or uh, just for safety's sake. Um, but you can also go to the county tax assessor's web, uh, website to get that information. And it's also going to be included on your annual value notice, okay, to see what exemptions you're receiving on the property, okay? Um, at this time, I'm going to open it up for any questions that we may have. I, I'm, I'm seeing here that we might have a few. Questions. Um, actually, we don't have any questions, forgive me. Um, I just wanted to make certain, but that is all that I have. Lone Star Legal Aid, we don't really tackle into the protest, uh, protest hearings per se, but we are there when it comes to homeowners needing assistance with the exemptions and property owners needing assistance with the collections part. That is what we run into and that uh, we are uh, able to help with more often than not. So feel free to uh, go online, uh, visit us at lonestarlegal.org Lone Star to either apply online or, or call into the main 1-800 number to make an application if you need assistance with the property tax. Thank you for your time and I wish you all good luck.